When was the last time you had a real meaningful conversation with a family member or coworker? I'm not talking about small talk or a quick chat about the weather. I mean a genuine exchange of ideas where you walked away feeling like you learned something, felt something, or maybe even change your mind about an issue. Hello friends, welcome to the Challenging Conversations podcast where we tackle some of the most pressing and controversial issues of our time with the biblical worldview. I'm your host, Jason Jimenez, and today we'll be digging deep into why there seems to be so much division and hatred and severing ties with those who disagree with one another. I've asked Dr. Sean McDowell, a professor at Biola University and co-author of the new book, End the Stalemate, Move Past Cancel Culture to Meaningful Conversations, to join us in exploring and finding answers to the cultural issues we are facing in communication. Sean will help us navigate ways to overcome the division caused by cancel culture and to understand when and how to interact with someone who may firmly reject the Christian faith. So if you're ready to learn how to have challenging conversations without losing the people who matter most, stay with us. This is going to be a powerful episode. John, my friends, great to have you back on the show. It's a treat to be here. Thanks, Jason. Well, I was thrilled, obviously, hence the name, Challenging Conversations, that we built after I wrote the book, Challenging Conversations, which you've been so helpful through the years to help promote and give me some insight. But to see you write this book with Tim Mulhoff, Mulhoff, I should say, uh, who's a great professor over at Biola as well, and he's really, I think, been in, like in therapeutic ways, but also just in practical mm. ways, has really helped the church learn how to work through a lot of division or disagreements. And he's an expert in that field. And so for you guys to pair up together and to do a book, I thought was fascinating. So as I was going through it, I thought it was interesting that in the subtitle, you mentioned cancel culture before talking about meaningful conversations. And I know people toss it around a lot, cancel culture this, cancel culture that. So let's just do this. Help us first understand what cancel culture is and then lead into how that's affecting how Christians communicate with one another and even to the point of how they either try to share their faith or don't share their faith. Cancel culture is a term that seems to have popped up the last, I don't know, four to five years or so. That basically when you say something or do something or hold a position that somebody deems wrong or offensive or harmful, we pile on that person primarily through social media and try to get their reputation or their platform or their livelihood canceled. Hmm. Now we've seen it on the left, and I think there's there's a significant number of studies that would show at least like in universities and in the media and other kind of power centers, it's more strongly on the left. But I'll tell you, Jason, as you know, we also see it on the right. Hmm. It is a phenomena today where people are just afraid their lives are going to get canceled. And so what happens is either Christians jump on the cancel culture bandwagon and we just act the same way that the culture does, canceling others. I'm not saying there's not a time to cancel somebody, at least from, say, public ministry or a job that they have. Certainly there's things people can do that you can say you've lost the right to have that platform but we often don't have that discernment. Mm. So oftentimes we just jump on the platform and try to silence people we disagree with or we don't like, or we live in fear and don't say what we believe. And I think knee-jerk canceling people or living in fear are not two options for a Christian who wants to be faithful in our cultural moment. Yeah, and so like you said, Christians are actually canceling one another. So it's not just like the left is trying to cancel, which that is true, like you said, and you guys talk about in the book to some degree. But what you guys specifically address in in the stalemate is how Christians, and I hate to use a term because it's kind of flipping and and kind of generalize, generalize it, but sometimes, you know, we as Christians can oftentimes not look to understand where someone's coming from. And so we can, you said, argue with them or get defensive right? Rather than simply listen to what they have to say, because that certainly is a big issue in our, in the church world, right? Today, where a lot of Christians are, like I said, are quick to attack one another rather than sit back and listen and learn how to appropriately engage in dialogue. And so what you guys do right off the bat in chapter one, the title there is divided and angry. Mm -hmm. How did we get here? 
So obviously I got to ask the, the question, how did we get here to the point where you said, like you said, cancel culture is kind of a, a fairly new term that we've been throwing around for quite some time. And it's not just the left canceling the right, if you will, or the right trying to cancel the left, but sometimes, and not saying all Christians are on the right, but also, and more specifically, Christians are actually canceling one another. How did we get here then? What are some of the factors that have led to this? So I've done a number of co-author books, and this one, Tim and I divided up the chapters, and it actually says my name at the top that I wrote this one. And as best I can tell, I think there's kind of a perfect storm. If you remember that storm off of Massachusetts, there was like three storms mm. that coalesced a number of decades ago and became like this mega storm. And they even made a movie about it with Mark Wahlberg and others in it. I think we have a cultural perfect storm that's taking place. <clears throat> One of the factors is we just have broken, hurting people. We've seen an increase in mental illness and depression and loneliness. And we've heard it said, hurt people, hurt people. Mm -hmm. When we're hurting, we're likely to respond out of that pain and out of that unhealthiness. So oftentimes when people respond mean or angrily, in my better moments, Jason, I try to think, well, how has this person been treated this way in their own life? How has this person been hurt? Yeah. I think that's one piece of it that's just been exacerbated, obviously, since COVID past four or five years. I think another piece is just that we live in such a divided culture in terms of uh, the positions that we have. So take the transgender issue. On one side, to not use preferred pronouns and recognize that a biological he can be a she if that individual chooses to do so, is to like cause this kid to have depression and loneliness and maybe take their own life. That's one side, you see how much is at stake there. The other side says, wait a minute, actually not affirming that somebody's body is a part of their identity can't help this person flourish, not to mention there's God's design here that says we are body and soul and they should line up. My whole point is there's these divided issues just ripping our culture apart they get on the level of worldview, not just differences in policy, but deep worldview issues. And we see this in the church with critical race theory, with vaccines, with a whole host of issues. Mm, yeah. There's all these topics. And of course, on top of that, with social media, now we have this little rectangle that's in our pockets mm -hmm. where we can all communicate to the world ideas that we have. And you and I know the social media is built to provoke us. It's built to make us angry. People are probably more likely, statistically speaking, to share and watch this podcast if they get angry and if they get challenged and they get jarred and you and I you know, spar at each other. That's just a fact because we're motivated by drama. And so I think you start to put those pieces together. And like, I'd kind of be surprised if we didn't have a cancel culture right now. And, you know, I guess the fourth piece is we've just lost the ability to communicate. We don't know how to ask good questions. We don't know how to listen well. And I think a lot of our technology dehumanizes us where it's, you're not seeing somebody face to face embodied in the present and strips away the things that helps us communicate well. Yeah, I think that's well said. It's, it just triggered something in me through the years with the book challenging conversations the one thing that seemed to upset a lot of people in response again most of these people we don't know in our ministry but they read the book and then that the chapter seven about lgbt people i said and i saw that you guys did and you reference robert gagnon on the the preferred pronouns issue which is a great discussion by the way and somebody that we highly recommend that people can get his take but I just said, look, the issue at hand is not whether or not you ref you, per you refer to them in their preferred pronouns. The issue here is this person is lost and confused and struggling, and we want to be Christ to that person. So I didn't address it. They, a lot of people, again, Christian, they said in name, I'm a Christian, but they're like, how dare you? That's crossing a line. You're accepting compromise. You're Marxist or leftist. And I, I didn't I didn't even take up the issue at all. But I think what's important is that people understand too, and you've done this frequently, Sean, through the years, is we don't respond to that, obviously, by showing hatred. We can disagree. You can say, hey, thank you for the comment, but you know, try to give a 
uh, you know, uh, may, maybe make a slight case without being defensive, but sometimes it's just not even, it's not even necessary or, or even worthwhile because mm -hmm. of the tone, like you said, in which people are coming at you, they're not trying to have a dialogue. They want to argue or they want to prove you wrong. So you have to use discernment in those, in those areas, by the way, and this is something I wanted to ask you, how have you done that then to discern appropriately? Like you say, cause you give these factors as to why we are kind of in the mess we are right now. So how do you navigate through them personally as, as a, as just a Christian apologist and a professor? Let me comment first on that example that you gave, because I think it's apropos. Uh, in the back of the book, Tim and I ask each other questions, and we have a difference over whether Christians should use preferred pronouns. Mm -hmm. And we go back and forth, and then we decided to have an hour-long conversation about this. I threw it on my YouTube channel. People can watch if they want to, where I think a lot is at stake. I think this issue matters. Yeah. And personally, I increasingly think it's a mistake in the vast majority of circumstances to use a preferred pronoun. Now, what Tim and I wanted to do is not throw rhetorical bombs at each other, not attack each other, not make it personal, but listen, make our arguments, help people understand what's at stake and how we as a church should respond. Enough of that doesn't happen. So I have no problem with people challenging your views or challenging mm -hmm. my views on an issue. But we often don't think about doing it in a way that's effective. I mean, right. you know this, you've written a book on communication, and I, my undergrad degree was in communication. Yeah. And this is very simplistic, but basically you have a sender, and you have a message, mm -hmm. and you have a receiver. And as Christians, we are the sender, we have a message. We have to think wisely and strategically about how our message is most likely to be received and heard. Well, most people that comment aren't thinking about saying, you know, if I think Jason's wrong on this, how do I get him to rethink it? How do I challenge his right. ideas here? How do I create a conversation? Rather, they're thinking about themselves, the sender, the message they want to get across, and probably virtue signaling or attacking you or proving you wrong. That doesn't help the conversation. And frankly, it doesn't help us arrive at whether or not we should use preferred pronouns. Because the reality is, as much as I talk about this and I try to communicate well, when somebody comes right at me, my human nature is not like, oh, let me listen. Maybe I'm wrong. Yeah. Let me get this correct. I'm competitive. I played college hoops. My yeah. instinct is like, let's go. But I need to taper that down. So uh, all I can say on your question, it's a tough one, is I don't want – first off, it's, it's, it's a stewardship of time. Yeah. I mean there's people all the time, Twitter, Instagram – TikTok, YouTube, commenting. I just don't have the time mm -hmm. to spend hours responding. I only have so much emotional capital that I can spend that I don't want to take it for my wife and my kids and my family. And I, I try to look at the nature of a comment. If somebody's attacking me, I'm probably not going to respond. If it's if it's a Twitter handle, it's not even the person. Usually I'm thinking, wait a minute. I am Sean McDowell, and my image says that. They know who they're talking with, and this is somebody hiding behind a Twitter handle. Mm. I don't even know who this person is. That's not a fair conversation. I'm probably not going to respond to that in most circumstances. So I don't have a perfect solution for you, but it's just a trade-off between time we have, emotional capital, whether it's worth engaging somebody or not. But the last thing I'd say is usually when I respond, it's not just for that person. It's hopefully for other people watching, maybe model for them a good way of asking a question or a gentle word, or at times just pointing back and saying, you know what, you actually got this really wrong. No, but that alone is helpful. Like there, there's, it's almost like a mental checklist, right? As you pray, okay, Holy Spirit, how do I walk in the spirit so I don't fulfill the lust of the flesh because I want to defend myself. But instead, like you said, do I have the emotional capital here? Do I have time to do this? And what is that person's intent? You may not know the person, but that's helpful enough. This leads us into something that I think is even more common and a lot of confusion that comes with this territory. And that is just disagreeing with one another. And I like the fact that you guys address this because even when in my investigative work and research and talking with clinical psychologists and teachers and pastors and just you know, everyday folk, it's almost like it's wrong for Christians to disagree with each other. They, they, they think that's being divisive, 
you know, and yet the Bible clearly tells us, Sean, in Romans 14, 1, that we're not to quarry over petty things. But there comes a point, and I'd like for you to expound on this and, and, and show us maybe even in some, in some cases that you've seen, where actually disagreeing with one another is actually healthy and can actually not only produce more meaningful conversations, but strengthen the relationship. Well, Paul disagreed pretty firmly with Peter, and he wrote it in his letter, Galatians, for the world to see. <laughs> yeah. Now, he was also correcting him and, and chastising him, and he's the Apostle Paul. I get it. But truth is supposed to unite us, but it also sometimes can divide us. We cannot compromise truth. Part of the debate that's taking place right now is Christians are trying to figure out what hills do I die on? And what hills do I not die on? So is natural marriage and defending it a hill that someone should die on? I would say yes. Well, there's other debates people are happy to like, okay, it's complementarian versus egalitarian, an important issue. Some would say it's a salvific issue. How central is that? Is that as important as the nature of marriage? How about identifying as a gay Christian? Is that just something we agree to disagree over? Or is that not only unwise, mm. but immoral, so to speak? What makes it hard is everybody's trying to figure out what those hills we die on. And the goal pole has, goal post has moved, so to speak. I mean, there was a time where my dad could literally say, I'm just going to defend the scriptures, biblical sexuality, resurrection, deity of Jesus. Let's go. And everybody got on board with that. Now there's so many issues dividing us. So I want to be as gracious as I can be towards people who see the world differently within the Christian fold and not die on secondary mm -hmm. issues. Yeah. I want to be gracious and kind. Now there's probably sometimes, Jason, where I've been too gracious and kind and thought, you know what, that's actually an issue I need to push back more firmly on. And we should divide over this issue. On the flip side, there's people that want to divide over everything. And it's like they're the doctrine police telling everybody on every issue what view they have to hold. Or they're like tossed out of the fold. That's too tight. And that's not helpful. So I would just ask people to say, is this a hill worth dying on? What's my biblical support for this? And then how do I meaningfully engage those who see the world differently in a respectful, kind way. If we would just try to operate according to those principles, uh, I think we could make a lot of headway. Well, you just mentioned you and Tim disagree on something and you guys even put it in the book. And it, did you do that to kind of show people that this is kind of how you have conversations with disagreement when you still, as the Bible says in Romans 12 verse 10, honoring one another, or 1 Peter 2, 17, showing hospitality. Is that why you guys kind of put that in there as an example for people to see? Yeah, the reality is there are Christians who differ firmly over that example of whether we should use preferred pronouns or not. We could have, we could have taken 20 yeah, issue. other yeah. issues. Right. We had differences on exactly what critical race theory is and how we should respond to it. We, I mean, there's tons of issues we could take. But we're trying to model for people how you can firmly <clears throat> and biblically discuss and debate and differ over important topics like that, hopefully as a model for other people. Because frankly, there's just a lot of people, Jason, you know this, there's a lot of parents who are in relationship with their kids and differ over this issue or other ones. There's people in small groups differing over this. Well, how do we navigate a lot of these differences in a way that's redemptive and also truthful? We were just trying to model for people what that might look like. Yeah. I, and I say well done with that because we need those type of examples. And even like you said, we're not perfect. We, we shouldn't be claiming to be perfect because we know that we're born in sin. And we you just use the word, we've been redeemed through the blood of Christ and we look to him as our example and that's a beautiful picture when you can actually see two Christians who are not compromising in God's truth, but at the same time, they're not going to compromise in their relationship with one another, which leads me to one of the things that obviously when it comes to disagreement is trying to learn and understand that person's worldview or how they perceive or their perspectives in reality, like when it comes to values or when it comes to 
their moral outlook, you know, and if it's if they're framing that based off of a view of God and what that view is, etc. But you say one of the primary influences for shaping and developing, if you will, someone's worldview is relationships. Expound on that. So I have a friend now, and we're we're in the process of coming up with a book proposal to write a book together. He's an atheist, and it's a point counterpoint book. Mm-hmm. Now, he has described himself tongue-in-cheek as an atheist New York media elite. <laughs> he, <laughs> That's a mouthful. I love it. Like, yeah. Obviously, you have to have a sense of humor and know your audience to describe yourself that way. Well, he's written for New York Times Magazine, New Yorker, MSNBC, Slate, like these kind of publications. And he grew up in Greenwich Village, uh, Manhattan, which is the hub of the sexual revolution mm. on the East Coast and of the LGBTQ movement. When I interviewed him, Jason, he said, Sean, probably 40% of the men that I knew growing up were gay. And then he said, I've never organically met an evangelical Christian. Never organically. Now, stop and think about this. If you grow up in that world and you feel cared for and you have good experience in life and good relationships, you don't know any Christians and you get really one perspective of the world, doesn't it make sense that you would see the world the way that he sees the world? I share that with people trying to say, look, ideas matter Hmm. and we need to debate and discuss this and we're all held accountable for what we believe. But can we at least start by having some charity and understanding why he sees the world as he does? It's our relationships more than anything else that shape our worldview. You want to know what somebody believes. One question I'll ask them is I'll just say, tell me about the most important people in your life. Maybe it's a coach, a teacher, a parent, an uncle, uh, whoever it is. Those people and that relationship with them is going to be kind of the, 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 the seat, so to speak, of where ideas come through. So in that chapter, we have a pyramid. At the top are your like actions and your choices. Below that are our values shape shape how we act. Below that is our worldview. Mm -hmm. But our worldview is formed through relationships. And so oftentimes when I try to get below a person's worldview, it's one thing to say, what do you believe about God? What do you believe about the afterlife? What do you believe about human nature? Well, that's purely cognitive. When I start getting down to tell me about your family, tell me about your experience, your relationship with Christians, tell me about your experience with Democrats or Republicans, these relationships are profound. I mean, if somebody doesn't know a Christian and they have a bad perception of Christians, maybe from an experience or from the media, in the back of their mind, it's just like, I don't want to be a part of that club. (laughs) Well, Mm. and I get it. Yeah. That relationship is profound and that's why many people when they shift worldviews you often find there was a relationship that kind of incarnated that belief system and through that relationship changed their perceptions and ultimately gave them permission to shift how they see the world and obviously it's not to say that they're not reading they're not investigating on the course own. but like you said that incarnational truth that's embodied by someone like you or me right with somebody who we know doesn't believe in Christ, and we're not just being dogmatic and forceful on them. Um, that's so important. And I think that that is something that you guys do very well in the book. And so I highly encourage people, if they're finding themselves in a situation where I am around a lot of people who are not a Christian, I don't necessarily know what their worldview is, but my relationship with them matters. And therefore, I need to make more of an opportunity to engage them. That's so important. Okay, so in chapter six, it's called Engaging Explosive Issues, and you write this. If some issues are so explosive and certain conversations are so controversial, then why engage in the first place? Given the risks, why bother? Shouldn't unity trump the need for such dicey conversations? Why not simply set them aside and discuss less divisive topics? This is an understandable temptation, and there can undoubtedly be reasons not to engage in certain conversations. 
As the writer of Ecclesiastes said, there is a time and a place for everything, including a time to be quiet and a time to speak. That's Ecclesiastes 3, verse 7. And then you go on to say, some conversations may be best to avoid, at least for a season. Yet I am convinced that such conversations are vital today. So I love that quote, and I, and I, and I thoroughly enjoy that chapter. So for the time on the show and for our listening audience, help us to unpack that. When is the right time, Sean, to engage those people who we know, whether they're a family member, a friend, a coworker, who outright reject the Christian faith? So a, a somewhat simple example that I make the point. Kid comes home from school. Parent has missed the kid all day right when they walk through the door. And the kid is tired and exhausted and just wants to get a snack and maybe watch some cartoons. Hey, how was your day? Well, most kids are not eager at that point to have a conversation with their parent. It's not that they don't want to talk to a parent. It's just not the right time. So for any conversation to work, it's got to be the right time. I mean, I've got to, if somebody's really hungry, not the right time. If somebody's really stressed, the Thanksgiving dinner table, probably not the right time for politics. I've made that mistake, Jason, and had to apologize because <laughs> I just let ideas get in front of me and I want to know and I'm curious and I want to talk about stuff. So there's a timing to a conversation. I love to have conversations in places like Starbucks or McDonald's or a local coffee shop. Number one, people are around, so it kind of is going to mute people freaking out. Mm -hmm. It creates yeah. the right environment for a conversation. You have less distractions. So sometimes if we want to talk with somebody meaningful about something meaningful, just say, hey, I'd love to talk with you about this. When can we grab coffee and talk about it? So then they're in the right mindset. It's the right time and it's the right place. That's a huge piece of it. So I think one of the reasons a lot of conversations fail is we just don't. I mean, I had I had one recently or asked somebody and somebody else chimed in and and made it kind of personal with me. And I was like, wow, like, I can't believe you just insulted me like that. And I chose to let it go. And later I thought, you know what? That was not that that person should have said that, but it was partly on me that I shouldn't have asked this other person with other people around about a controversial topic. People just can't take it. It's just the way that it is. So that was partly on me should have picked a better time. Now, are there certain people that we shouldn't have conversations with? Maybe, at least for a season, uh, there might be a time. Now, like, it depends on who it is, of course. All right. Like with my wife, there's very, I can't think of anything we've just agreed not to talk about mm -hmm. because of how close we are and living together and how important it is. Now, there might be a time where you just say, this is so painful. I want to talk to you, but I'm going to need some space to think it through. Okay. But with my wife, at some point, because of the nature of our relationship, there is nothing off the table we won't discuss. But a second cousin and other people in which there's family unity at play, you know, there might be certain topics you don't discuss with certain people. Uh, yeah, I'll leave it at that. But bottom line is we just need to use wisdom. Some people are more willing to have conversations than others. Some people can take it more than others. Some people are more eager more than others. And of course, when I say this, we've got to ask ourselves first, rather than assuming it's all on other people, do I listen well? Am I open to this conversation? How do I receive when somebody disagrees with me? So more than anything, it's literally, you know this, Jason, it's the golden rule. Treat people the way you want to be treated. And when we do that, I think most people, Again, right time, right place, right attitude are open to spiritual conversations and political and cultural conversations if we approach it well. Yeah, well said. So last question, what what would you, I mean, I know you've written a lot of books and every time when we, we pray and you know, like you say, we can kind of collaborate and you're kind of working through a project, you're hoping you have certain objectives, right? When you're putting the proposal out there, things that you want this to to achieve, a lot of times it's because you're assessing the environment, saying, "Oh, we need to address this, or we need to talk about this more. I want to help the church be better equipped." But when it came to this book and doing it with a colleague of yours, Tim, 
What do you both hope to get out of this since it's already been out for a while and, you know, it's circulating? What is your hope and prayer that people will take away when they read the book? We got an email this week from the director of a big ministry I won't mention. And he just said, thanks for the book. This is exactly what we need in our cultural moment. Mm. I'm going to take my staff through this chapter by chapter, and we're going to talk about how well do we listen? How well do we take the perspective of other people? How often are we asking good questions? How much are we compromising when appropriate for the sake of relationship without compromising truth? I've had a few ministry leaders reach out to me and say, this gives me a platform to, to discuss. Maybe it's across races. Maybe it's across generations. Maybe it's across political party. We tend to just stay at arm's length rather than kind of leaning in and engaging one another, which leads to understanding. So that's the kind of response that, that, I think articulate your question. I mean, this book was Tim's idea. He did his PhD in communications mm -hmm. at University of North Carolina, Chapel Hill. And I think his entire doctoral committee were like feminists and not Christians and left winging secular. And it was all about how do we communicate across massive worldview differences? And he came to me and said, Sean, I've done a lot of the academic scholarly work on communicating across differences. He goes, I feel like you're practically doing this. And of course, Tim is a colleague of mine at Biola. He said, you're kind of doing this in your conversations, sometimes on stage, on your YouTube channel. What if we come together and just try to help people do what we've been doing for a long time? Now, no book is easy to write. That's the understatement of the year. Yeah. But of books, this was easier because I was so passionate about it. Yeah. It was really trying to articulate the things that I've been doing for 20 plus years in a way that could just help other people do the same. So my YouTube channel, honestly, Jason, I'm just trying to mentor for people how to have these conversations. So I've had progressive Christians on and a lot of people say, God, that helps me talk with my son or now my spouse or somebody in my neighborhood who's a progressive Christian, uh, atheists and skeptics and Muslims trying to mentor people and just how to do the same. You can have this conversation. And then the book just kind of captures that and walks through with steps and examples and research. Well, I can say personally, we've known each other for years that you've been a great example, even for me, you know, cause when it's like one thing, like when you actually step foot into a round, like when one, you're with Tim, an expert in communications, you're like learning from him and like, is this good? Is this appropriate? But you're also considering the people that have been those witnesses, been those examples, whether you're growing up in your childhood years or in ministry or in the church, a particular family member. And so when you do write on something like this, it's powerful when you have somebody not, you know, that are living out the scriptures. So it's not just like, well, let's be like Paul. There's a time and a place for that. But it's also good when you see, as my pastor likes to say, Jesus in the flesh, like living out the teachings of Jesus in front of people and saying, Sean is showing us through the work of the Holy Spirit, through humility, how you can engage someone who opposes your worldview adamantly. So I want to I want to end with mm. this because I want to bring on a practical note. And there's a lot of episodes you have out there. And I want to give you a moment to let people know where they can get the book in your podcast for sure, which I tell people I, I make sure it's one of those things in my research and my growth that I'm, I'm keeping track of, of what you're talking about and it's fruitful for me personally. But you use this as an example and I know a lot of people came at you saying, why are you engaging this person? But Brandon Robinson, like you said, a, mm. a, 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 you talk about it in the book. I mean, an, an openly gay man who's ordained, obviously in a liberal denomination and you know he takes a lot of polarizing positions on a lot of scripture, even his take on how to interpret scripture. For just the people on the, you know, listening and watching, why do you have those conversations with Brandon and how have you seen your relationship with him? Not getting too personal, of course, but just how you've sure. been a witness to him, right? And how that's kind of maybe become more meaningful through the years because of your patience, your humility, and your willingness to hear his heart 
not just attack him because of it's a, con a controversial take, but to hear his heart as a human being. So people need to realize the place in which I have this conversation with Brandon and with Colby and with other progressive mm -hmm. Christians is not in a church. I'm not pastoring a flock. I'm a professor and this is on YouTube. Yeah. So it's a particular setting and he already has a platform. He already has a big TikTok following. He's been posting stuff online. He has a certain level of a following. And so I like the way he carries himself. I think he's totally wrong on a bunch of issues and he thinks I'm completely wrong. My goal is just let's model what a civil conversation could look like, but let's bring clarity on what we believe and why we believe it. And so he has a book he wrote in which he argues that Jesus sinned. Mm -hmm. And I just think that leads to a completely different gospel. Now Jesus needs a savior. So why did he even have to die? We're talking about a different gospel. So we looked at that passage and I pressed him to try to explain his views and talk about what follows from it. But rather than some people just did videos critiquing him at a distance, which is fine. When you speak publicly, you can do that. I wanted to bring him on and see if he could explain and articulate and respond to some of the questions that I had. I also just wanted people to walk away and go, okay, so he calls himself a progressive Christian. I consider myself like a historic Christian or an evangelical Christian. What do we have in common? And where do we differ about the identity of Jesus, about the nature of the gospel, about God's character? And I think anybody watching that goes, okay, these guys are speaking the same words, but they mean very, mm -hmm. very different things by the authority of the Bible and the person of Jesus and just the purpose of the Christian life. And so I just value clarity highly. And so when I think somebody comes in good faith, like I think Brandon does, as wrong as I think he is, I'm like, let's talk, let's do it. And he's working on a book. Uh, I think comes out in like seven months on like the queering of the church and LGBTQ theology. I imagine he's gonna trust me to talk about that now in a way he won't to other people that have critiqued him differently. And I think Brandon would invite this. We're gonna get into some of the passages. We're gonna debate and discuss this. And I can't wait to ask him questions like, what do you think is at stake with this? What do you think I have wrong in my view of sexuality? Let me explain to you what I think is at stake and what I think you have wrong. And let's respectfully walk through and discuss and talk about this issue. So anybody watching it can say, now I understand what's at stake. Mm -hmm. Now I see how he interprets that passage. Now I understand where he's coming from. And so, I, yeah, I mean, I'll talk with almost anybody. But again, if I was pastoring a church and I was bringing people into a flock, I might be very selective and different in the kinds of conversations I had. I mean, I recently went to a mosque and a Hindu temple and brought my two different sons with me on different trips. And it wasn't a debate. It was, I want to learn, build some common ground, start a relationship. And you know, some people pushed back and said, you didn't share the gospel there. And I said, fair enough, that wasn't the time and place but the relationship is not done and it's opened up the door for a lot more conversations that people who just stand from a distance and criticize are not invited into. I think just even that what you said is, well, there was actually a lot there, but two main things that stick out that I want to close with. Number one is you're, you're willing and able to have these conversations as you pray and God will put them in your life instead of run from them. And two, as you were just talking about, there are times when it's not just like, if you were to die tonight, would you go to heaven or hell? You know, and think that if you didn't deliver the Romans road or something like that, it was not a fruitful or spirited conversation led by God. And you, like you said, you have to discern what God is doing. Acts 17, we know that great passage in Mars Hill, the way that Paul was able to navigate in the narrative with the Epicureans and the Stoics and lead them to their pursuit of the, or the quest for truth and how he was able to be compelling and personified that in a very friendly narrative apologetic way by telling story. And that sometimes is what in, in many cases we see in scripture. So that's a, that's a, that's an important 
thing that you just said there, Sean, because oftentimes in the evangelism world of training in the church, we think, okay, you got to find people who are not saved and you got to share the gospel with them. It's going to look different with different people. And even just mm -hmm. taking that pressure off of people, that's not how actually relationships work, where I have this hidden agenda that I'm bringing you over like Amway. You know what I mean? And I'm trying to get you like involved in something, you know, when I say God's really laid you on my heart and then all of a sudden I'm selling you something. So I think that that's very helpful too, because I have certainly seen that, how that can really jeopardize and cause, like you said, people outside the church to not trust people, you know, because of that. So well said. Hey, my friend, we could talk about this obviously in so many different angles. And I so appreciate your example and the portrayal, even what you guys have put forth in the book. So just let our people know where they can get the book and a little bit more about your podcast. Yeah, you can probably find it at any place you have a bookseller. Amazon is a quick, easy link or the the publisher. Uh, obviously, you can find it from Tyndale. Uh, so my podcast, we have kind of two. Scott Ray and I co-host mm -hmm. a podcast out of Biola, which is primarily audio. It's called Think Biblically. We do a weekly podcast where we interview an author on some broader topic, science, history, philosophy, culture, think biblically about it. And then we've recently started a Friday cultural update in which we take three or four stories of the week and help people think biblically about it and then answer questions that listeners send in. That's Think Biblically. My YouTube channel is separate from that. I'll do one or two uh, videos a week. And a lot of these are interviewing experts on intelligent design, have an interview coming up with William Lane Craig. But this is also where I engage atheists and agnostics and progressive Christians at time to just kind of talk through some of these issues. That's where I put the documentary going to a mosque, put the documentary going to a Hindu temple and speaking with kind of a Hindu guru that was there. So that YouTube channel is more focused on apologetics and having meaningful spiritual conversations. Well, that's great. So I encourage everybody watching or listening to check out those, those websites and also check out Sean McDowell, the great work that he's doing. He's a trusted voice, my friends, and he's someone that you know. I'm sure you already know who he was to begin with. But if you've not picked up the book, In the Stalemate, I just went through it before I had him on the show, and it was one of those things I highlighted several things and looking to apply in my own personal life. So, Sean, thanks for coming mm -hmm. on the show. Thanks, brother.